So John, you have some experience as a distributor, is that right? You were That's right. I okay. had my own distribution company. We distributed uh, the British film The Wicker Man, the original one with Edward Woodward and Christopher Lee, not the remake with uh, Nicolas Cage, and uh, uh, also Dennis Hopper's Out of the Blue, and uh, a Richard Longcrane movie called The Haunting of Julia with uh, Mia Farrow and Tom Conti and Keir Dulay. Uh, did national distribution, indie distribution on, on those movies. That was before I started really uh, seriously working as a screenwriter and producer. And do you want to mention you, you rescued those movies because they were on the shelf? They were, they were kind of lost movies, particularly The Wicker Man. We ended up restoring it to the, the version that the director intended and kind of, uh, kind of uh, accidentally invented a kind of classics division distribution which didn't exist at the time. Um, that's a whole, a whole other topic for a whole different interview, but, but it gave me, what I liked about it in terms of what I do now is that uh, I had to create trailers, I had to create posters, I had to do publicity on these films, I had to talk, find, get journalists interested in them and set up interviews and things. So that was great background for being an indie filmmaker. Didn't really, in a way, doing studio level films it was frustrating because kind of sometimes I felt that I wanted to offer advice where none was being asked. And uh, but for an indie film where you have to do everything at some point or other, it's it's I think a good background to understand something about how the business works and, and sales and distribution. I was a producer's rep too, which meant lots of times people would bring me movies in various stages, finished or sometimes not finished. And uh, I got a little bit of a reputation as a film doctor. People could bring me movies that were troubled, and I could maybe make some recommendations to improve them from being unreleasable to merely being unbearable to watch. No, but that helped you with directing, too, because you were sort of helping directors get out of holes, and it helped train your eye, you know, for the future. Yeah, like I'll never forget a great piece of advice I got from some director along the way, which was... Uh, uh, more setups, less takes. I think one of the big mistakes that uh, you end up in the in post production with is that you wish you had some other angle of a shot. You wish you had something to cut away with, and instead you've got kind of the perfect take of things that don't cut together particularly well or don't help you uh, with the pace of the movie. So I really tried to remember to uh, to do more setups and not so many takes. I mean, you have to get get it, but you know, somewhere there has to be a compromise when you're making an, a modestly budgeted indie movie. And uh, I, I tried to do more takes. I mean, sorry, tried to do more setups, less takes. And you mentioned earlier rescuing film. So in keeping with that, rescuing the state of independent film. You know, since 2008, things have changed everywhere. Can you talk about where you see indie film headed? Where's the audience? Well, the paradigm for movies generally is broken, and nowhere is it, from an economic point of view, and nowhere is it more broken than in the indie film space. It's the great news is that it's become easier than ever to make a movie. I mean, it used to be when I started out in the business that if, if you saw that a budget on a movie was under a million dollars, you really didn't even bother to look at it. it you knew it couldn't be something that could go into theaters, uh, generally speaking. You know, there were exceptions like Kentucky Fried Movie and, and a few other things, maybe Night of the Living Dead, but with rare exception, you, you had to spend a million dollars at the very least to make anything that was releasable. And uh, now, of course, people are making movies for under $50,000 that look fine. I mean, they, the scripts may not be good, the acting may not be good. Those are usually the big problems with indie movies. The script stinks and the acting stinks. Uh, nothing has changed. You know, it's also the problem with studio movies, is the script isn't any good and the acting isn't any good. Although with pro studio movies, at least you have professional actors for the most part. Um, it isn't the production values where movies fall down. It's its story and its believability of acting. So 
Uh, in terms of making movies and the distribution model, you've now got a real glut of movies out there. And there are gatekeepers. Never before have the gatekeepers been so important. Uh, you really do need a producer's rep. You really do need to get into a first-rate festival. You really do need to get good reviews in order to get anyone to really pay attention to your movie and to have a chance at distribution. Used to be you made your indie movie, you got into Sundance, and you sat back and you waited to see how many offers came in and if you could get a bidding war going. And that paradigm has, has all but disappeared. And I think that uh, what's happening in movies parallels what happened in music a few years ago, which is that movies are becoming ubiquitous. Uh, people can download the whole history of movies. It's available streaming on Netflix. It couldn't be more difficult and more competitive to get an indie movie into the marketplace. And as a result, uh, particularly in light of the economic slump that we're in as a country and, and globally, um, distributors are very risk adverse. When I would pick up a movie like Dennis Hopper's Out of the Blue, this was a movie everyone had rejected because they thought it was too tough. That you know there was no way audiences would 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 watch this very intense movie with Linda Manns about the, about punk rock. And I found you know I found the right audience for it, uh, and we spent an efficient amount of money to do that. But we we took a risk. Distributors today don't want to take any risk, and uh, at least very few of them do. And it makes it very hard on indie filmmakers, and it makes the means that the budgets have to go lower and lower. I mean, that's really the first rule today: is how inexpensively can you make it, and make it for even less than that if you possibly can. I just want to say that I, you're not saying every movie has bad acting and bad scripts, but for <laughs> no, a movie, of course, right? No, of course I just not. want to clarify that. But for a for an indie, all of us who all of us making indies, and especially if you're making an expensive indies, it behooves us to have a kick-ass script and kick-ass acting. There's really no excuse well, my for point, it not. I'm sorry. I just did, since I guess I flubbed that point at least with you. Well, uh, the I, point the the point I was simply trying to make was that it used to be that there it cost a certain amount of money to get a movie to a technically acceptable level. That amount of money has dropped. So what has always been the case, when a movie doesn't work, it's usually because the script doesn't work and because the acting isn't good, isn't good enough even if the script does work on some level. Those are the places where movies fall apart. So if you can hone your script, which is the cheapest thing to do, and if you can spend a lot of time working with actors, even if they're not professional actors, to get great performances, you can make your movie for almost nothing today. So it's really easier than ever to make a good movie and a great movie. Uh, just the, the barriers are what they've always been, script and performance, because money and technology have come down. The barrier now is distribution. Once you've made your movie, how do you get it seen? Is that clear? Have I yeah, no, absolutely. Them? Well, why don't you talk a little bit about what is different from what happened in 2008 to now? You've got a clear understanding of that in a concise way. Well, I, I, I don't know that anyone quite understands it. The, the, well, we all know what happened globally uh, to the real estate market and, uh, and to the banking system. And uh, I think that it expressed itself first in the indie film business. Uh, one of the things that really happened was that the studios got into the indie film business with classics divisions like uh, Warner, Warner, uh, Warner Independent and Paramount Vantage uh, joining Fox Searchlight, which had done it very successfully. They all had these divisions, and they all started kind of raising the budgets of indie movies. You had movies like uh, Blindness, uh, lovely you know, movie, really an art house movie though, that Paramount Vantage made, and I think it was a $20 million movie. And, you know, the, the, the line between studio movies and indie movies was really blurring, and prices were going up, and the audience just wasn't there. They were maybe overwhelmed by how many movies they were being expected to embrace. 
and I think the marketing departments of these studios perhaps didn't uh, know how to cost-effectively market these smaller films. It was a big distraction from their tentpole movies, their hundred million dollar movies, and I think they went back to the business that they know better. But it's, it's created a big dislocation in the indie film space. So, so if someone wants, so theatrical distribution is the goal of every indie filmmaker. So what is your advice? What is your advice? I'm, I'm interviewing you now. But like on Radio Free Albemuth, that's, we're committed to... I, I, don't think, I don't think theatrical distribution has to be the goal of every indie filmmaker. I think a lot of movies, it would be foolish to theatrically distribute them. But uh, with Radio Free Albemuth, we have a movie that because of the Philip K. Dick name, uh, the guy who wrote Blade Runner and Minority Report and Total Recall and Scammer Darkly and Adjustment Bureau, uh, we're able to really generate a lot of marketing buzz and promotion through theatrical and get reviews through theatrical that you couldn't get otherwise. Depends what kind of movie you have. There's no, there's no generality. I, I could very easily see making a movie where I just totally bypass theatrical. Uh, but this movie was kind of was kind of designed to be an art house movie that you could do the kind of cost effective distribution on that I did with with Wicker Man and Out of the Blue, you know, many years ago. But which there are a lot of companies that do very well still, like Magnolia and IFC and Oscilloscope. Mm -hmm.